Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Gagan Singh, and I'll be uh, talking about the topic of uh, pseudoaneurysm success. These are my, my formal disclosures. So um, aortic pseudoaneurysms uh, primarily are the ones that will uh, generally be referred to uh, structural heart interventionalists. Um, you know, they are usually, usually seen after uh, some sort of prior sternotomy and, and cardiac surgery. These are two examples here on the right-hand side. And as you can see, the one on the top and the one on the bottom, there's sternal wires here, and they've, they've undergone uh, a set of surgeries for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, most often than not, they've had some sort of aerotopathy uh, whether it's uh, traumatic or, or congenital um, or, or acquired, uh, but, but either way, you know, they've undergone some sort of sternotomy, and that's usually when we see it. In, in very rare cases, it can be post-trauma or, or from a post-infection. Uh, uh, and again, even if it's infection, it's usually related to a prior sternotomy. But these are overall rare. You know, we've, we've probably done uh, you know, maybe up to four or five a year for the last several years. And, and, and certainly the, the number of referrals we're seeing are increasing. Um, and, and there's generally a, 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 the reason that they are a concern is that even though they are rare, they can be life-threatening. Uh, they, uh, they're, they're a very heterogeneous group of, of, um, of, of pathology that we can see, you know, they come in different shapes, sizes, locations, and, and the, the, theoretical concern is that there is a predisposition to rupture uh, because there's a relatively low flow state within the pseudoaneurysms. There can be thrombus formation and then ultimately distal embolization. So, so these are all kind of valid concerns. Uh, and then for a patient who's, who's already undergone uh, prior sternotomy, and, and usually it's in an, in an acute or subacute setting, especially if it's an aortic pathology, you know, the, the chances for a redo surgical repair carry a relatively high morbidity and mortality. So, so I think a systematic approach uh, to closing these these pseudoaneurysms is is difficult because because part of the reason is the location can be very variable, uh, the neck dimensions are variable. Some have substantial rims while others don't. Uh, the aneurysm size again itself can be variable. Most of the, most of these will be saccular aneurysms, um, uh, and then uh, uh, and then you know the presence of thrombus also uh, can be variable. So. You know, it's important to get imaging. Imaging is going to be the most important thing when trying to determine what's the best modality to, to treat these. But really imaging, especially a gated CT, is very helpful. Uh, TE is generally adjunctive, uh, but for the most part, a cardiac gated CT is what's going to help you. Now, it helps you determine where the location of the, the, the septal or the pseudoaneurysm is, whether it's in the inner or outer curve, uh, whether it's at the uh, aortic root or in the uh, area ascending aorta itself. Is it at the site of a, of a prior suture line? Um, the CT also, uh, you know, allows you to uh, determine what the, the, the neck dimensions are. Again, most of these will have a neck, and it allows you to determine exactly where you're going to situate um, the device, especially the, the constrained waist. And then the most common occluder that's generally used will be the amplets or septal occluder uh, in, in these type of uh, occlusions. Um, in terms of delivering the device, you know, the standard torque views that, that Ampletzer makes may not be of sufficient length unless you uh, do an axillary access, um, but uh, I think you can use um, shuttle. If the patient is not too tall, you could use shuttle or destination sheets that come up to eight or nine French, uh, and, and these can be successful, and they, and they come of sufficient length to be able to deliver these, uh, these occluder devices. So here's a case uh, that we treated not too long ago. As a middle-aged male with a history of hypertension, tobacco use, and about six months before he was referred, um, you know, he had a pretty extensive type, type, a Stanford type A dissection. He underwent a surgical short segment interposition graft placement, and he ultimately made it out of that hospital after some uh, uh, some rehabilitation. Now, a surveillance CT at six months demonstrated that there was a, a pseudoaneurysm located at the lateral aspect of the sinotubular junction and and likely at the suture line. Now. Um, there was a persistent, pretty substantial, and we don't have time to go into it, but a pretty substantial dissection distal to the tube graft, which actually extended all the way into the great arch vessels uh, and actually all the way down his, his uh, descending aorta into the abdominal vasculature and ultimately into the iliacs as well. So here's the, the CT imaging of at least just the, the pseudoaneurysm itself. 
So here it is located on the lateral aspect um, of uh, and, and near the sinotubular junction. And this is again likely where the suture line was. And, and you can see that, that here is the pseudoaneurysm. And in this dimension, it measures about 16 millimeters. In this dimension, it measures about 18 millimeters. And then more importantly, because when you're that close um, to the aortic root, uh, you want to make sure that, you know, whatever device you use to seal this off is going to be far enough from any sort of important vital structure, particularly the coronary arteries. And in this case, we had plenty of distance. Uh, and then here on the right, you see exactly what, you know, whatever device we use and, and the disc size, we want to make sure that it's going to be constrained uh, within this defect itself. So, so on the right here is basically the general principle of trying to close all of these, um, um, you know, these uh, pseudoaneurysms is that you want to select a sheath size based on the per whatever device you're going to use. Um, you ultimately advance your destination or your shuttle sheath into the, into the aorta proximal to the pseudoaneurysm. And in this case, we used a JR4 guide, but again, use whatever you think can get you into, um, into the sac. And, and then ultimately you want to use a series of, of guide wires to be able to get into their curl them in there or coil them in there so then you can advance this concept of granddaughter daughter mother catheter so in other words a the outer catheter then another inner catheter and then another inner catheter and this kind of telescoping system is what ultimately allows you to advance this mother in this case which would be the daughter the the destination or the shuttle sheath into the defect to ultimately deploy the device so here's this patient's that same patient where you saw the ct here's a pseudoaneurysm we have a a uh a uh, pigtail in the aortic root. You can see the persistent dissection flap uh, in this patient. So, you know, we, we selected uh, a destination sheath in this case. Uh, and then what we did was we advanced it into the aorta. We used the JR4 to engage uh, the uh, the defect. And then we are kind of doing a direct sacculogram, I guess, if you want to call it. Um, but, uh, and then what we do is you advance a J wire. In this case, we advance a hydrophilic wire. You can't see it in this in this fluoro save, but we were able to advance it into the sac itself and then ultimately swapped out for stiff wires. And then so we can basically telescope the bigger sheath all the way into the sac itself. Now, once the bigger sheath is into the sac, we can then remove the guide wire, remove the, uh, the daughter and the granddaughter support catheters, uh, and ultimately you deploy the disc. And this is from here, from the first couple of steps that I, that are now actually grayed out, that's essentially the general concept. Now, in this final stage, in terms of deploying the device, you know, this is where there's a lot of variability, and a lot of it will depend on on where the defect is and and what the size is, and and uh, you know, what's the orientation or coaxiality of your delivery sheet compared relative to the defect itself. So, on the left, you see our initial deployment, and again, you can see we are about 90 degrees off in in our deployment, and just a simple tug test you know, the device basically popped right out. And so this is not a secure location. Um, so then what we did was we resheathed that device, uh, ultimately kind of redid all the steps, brought it all the way in there and kind of made it into ball mode. And we were made, it, when we made it into ball mode, we then kind of uh, were able to torque our delivery sheath and ultimately slowly kind of uh, unsheath the remainder of the system. And then it kind of nestled into that, into that sack. And and finally, this is our, our uh, final kind of tug test right before we deployed. So, so on the left, you see here's the pseudoaneurysm. On the right, uh, kind of a zoomed in view, you can see the distal disc is sitting in the sac itself. The waist is constrained. And then the more proximal disc is sitting into the aortic root. And so I think just in, in kind of wrapping up, you know, overall, these are rare, but they can be potentially life-threatening. Um, and, you know, redo surgery often is prohibitive in these patients. Uh, and pre-procedure imaging, uh, such as a gated CT, is 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 paramount. Um, sheath or device selection is really based on on the imaging, and that's why it becomes important. This concept of using multiple telescoping systems is helpful to be able to to, to deliver uh, the defect or to deliver the device to close the defect. You got to be ready to adapt. There is uh, no uh, straight straightforward way for each of these. You know, you have to kind of um, uh, beware of what sort of tools you have available. You have to have a full complement of devices on the shelf and, and different sheets and wires and catheters. And you have to be comfortable. And then, you know, I think what we still don't know is what the rates of, of long-term procedural success complications um, with this uh, method of closing these pseudoaneurysms. And, and I think um, uh, having a larger multi-center registry um, might, might help answer some of these questions. So thank you very much for your time.